the weapon of praise. 2 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 3 to 5 says, Though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. By the way, if you can share this broadcast, today is going to be a nuke to the kingdom of hell. Today, we're going to give, like my buddy Isaiah always says, a black eye to the devil. We're going to crush it. We're going to, he already had his head crushed 2,000 years ago, but we're going to put our foot back on that head and give him a double crush and a triple crush and remind the devil he doesn't get to decide our future. It's me and God that gets to decide the future as we obey and keep to his commandments. So share this broadcast. Share it as many times as you can. I'm glad to be back. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, though we walk in the flesh, we do not war after the flesh. But the weapons of our warfare are mighty through God for the pulling down of strongholds. So the Bible does not ignore the fact that we have weapons that are available to us at our disposal. Weapons, we have arsenal, we have tools and artillery that are able to not tolerate and cope with the weapons of uh, the problems that hell sends your way but to tear down to cast down to destroy and obliterate the 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 work that hell has set up in your life too much of christianity in modern day era is coping mechanisms it's People telling you this is how you can cope with depression. Here's how you can cope with anxiety. Here's how you can deal with your problems. We're not called to deal with our problems any more than we were called to deal with our sin. For this reason, the Son of God was made manifest to destroy the work of the devil. And so God has made power available to us to destroy everything hell would decide to set up in your life. However, I will tell you, there's a way that we can tap into that power and there's weapons God has given us to release that power. And the weapon that I'm going to deal with today is the weapon of our praise. I'm going to start off by reading Ephesians chapter 5 and verse uh, 17. This is what the scripture says. Therefore, do not be unwise. But understand what the will of the Lord is. And don't be drunk with wine in which is dissipation. But you should be filled with the Holy Spirit. Verse 19, speaking to one another in psalms, in hymns, in spiritual songs, in singing and making melody in your hearts to the Lord. Giving thanks, pay special attention, attention to verse 20. Giving thanks always. I want you to say it out loud wherever you're at and put it in the comment section always giving thanks always giving thanks always for all things to God the Father in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ submitting to one another in the fear of God. So we can deduct from this passage that praise and thanksgiving isn't something you do when you feel like it. It's not something that's optional for a child of God. Let me read this Psalm 150. This is what David said concerning praise it's not an option it's not something that we do haphazardly it's something we should schedule into our days it's something that you have to intentionally do because you're never really going to feel like praising God. You're never going to, your flesh, remember, is in opposition to your spirit. You're not free to do what you want to do. Your flesh is constantly warring with your spirit. You want to pray in your spirit. Your spirit is pressing. Jesus said the spirit is willing, but the flesh is what obstructs. It's the flesh that brings obstacles so that you are not free to do what you want to do. That's why the Bible says to pray always so that as you pray in fast you break down the flesh and the desires of the flesh so that your spirit is in command to do spiritual things and maintain spiritual disciplines so you want to pray but all of a sudden you know you, you feel like doing your taxes for the last 10 years which you've never felt like doing before all of a sudden these distractions pop out left right and center the same goes for praise in church you want to praise you feel the anointing moving there's great music going there's lyrics that represent the scriptures and God's moving on your heart you want to lift your hands but all of a sudden it feels like the devils put two boulders on each wrist and two ball and chains holding your hands down and all of a sudden every thought comes up I wonder what people are going to think if I lift my hands in church I wonder if my family's still going to accept me I wonder if my boyfriend's going to want to still date me I wonder if I'm still going to be accepted by those around me and so you feel the weight of the world coming behind 
your hands, holding you down. And you know why that happens. The Bible says we sat by the rivers of Babylon when the Israelites were in captivity. They sat by the rivers of Babylon and we hung up our harps. Their harps were what they used to play music to God. They hung up their harps. The devil wants you to hang your harp up because if he can remove praise from you, then he can remove any any hint or any indication that you'll ever have victory in your life. If he can remove, if the absent... If the devil can bring an absence of praise in your life, then he can successfully bring you absence of victories. When there is an absence of praise, there will be an absence of victory. So the devil's hardest target where he hits the most is by trying to suck out any desire or any ability or any... um, will to praise God because the moment your hands go up God inhabits the praises of his people when your hands go up God's presence comes down and when the presence of God enters into your situation the opposition has no choice but to bow and to flee that's why the scripture says we are to first submit to God submit to his authority submit to his discipline submit to his demands submit to his conditions and then we are to resist the devil and then he'll flee part of the way we resist the devil is by executing or implementing this weapon of praise in our life because the devil still in 2021 does not know how to handle a praise warrior the devil in 2021 still has no answer doesn't know how to tie the hands of a praise warrior because a praise warrior doesn't let his or his, his or her praise be dictated by external circumstances but rather by internal revelation of who God is I'm not praising God for what I'm seen right now i'm praising god because i know who he is and i know he's got integrity and i know he's not a man that he should lie and he's a god who what he says he will bring forth what he declares shall come to pass god's not a man that he should lie and so my praise is not dictated by external circumstances my praise is dictated through internal revelation of who god is i've seen my god in the scriptures i've seen how my god has never failed once i I've seen how my God honors his word above his own name and reputation. I know my God is too faithful to fail. And so despite what I'm seeing in the outs, in the exterior, I know that my God is going to make a way where there is no way. And today's the lowest I'll ever be from today. I'm moving on from glory to glory, from faith to faith and victory to victory. If that sounds like you and you've made a decision, I'm not going to sit and hang up my, my harps and just dwell by the river of Babylon sobbing and soaking in sorrow but today I'm gonna lift up holy hands without wrath or doubting for I know my God his mercy endures forever he's my light and my salvation and the war encamps against me in this I'm confident that the Lord is for me and if God before me who can be against me shout hallelujah Psalm 150 praise the Lord this is David Praise God in his sanctuary. Praise him in his mighty firmament. Praise him for his mighty actions. Praise him according to his excellent greatness. There's people that say, well, we shouldn't praise God for what he's done. Just praise him for who he is. What God does is a revelation of who he is. What God does is a revelation of who he is. When you praise God for what he's done, you're praising God for who he is. God doesn't just heal people. God is healing. He said, I am Jehovah Rapha. God doesn't just provide for people. He is provision. He said, I am Jehovah Jireh. God doesn't just make people righteous. He is righteousness. He says, I am Jehovah Tzikednu. God doesn't just do things. Everything he does is a revelation. It provides further insight into who he is. When he multiplied the five bread and the two fish and fed the 5,000, that wasn't just something God was doing he was trying to show the people if you trust in me I am your provider I am El Shaddai I'm the God of more than enough and though your beginnings might be small I'm the God of increase who will increase you to the point of abundance in the same vein when he healed blind Bartimaeus when he healed the leper when he healed 
the centurion's son, uh, the centurion servant who was dreadfully torment, tormented at the point of death. He wasn't healing them because he just wanted to show that I'm the Messiah. That's one of the reasons he did it. But more than that, he was doing it to show his nature, his who he is, his nature, his 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 being, his heart, his compassion. God doesn't just heal; God is healing. God doesn't just love; God is love. The Bible says. And so when we praise God for what what he's done we are successfully praising God for who he is so don't buy into that religious garbage that tells you don't praise him for who he, what he's done just praise him for who he is you can't separate the two when I praise God that he healed my body and he touched my mind when I was bound and held captive down by OCD and was a miserable mess and had no way out I'm not just praising him for what he did nine years ago I'm praising him for what he does today and what he'll do tomorrow that he's the God who didn't just deliver for me he's the God who is delivering me and he's the God who shall yet deliver me he's the one who's the same yesterday today and forevermore he hasn't changed and he has no plans on changing he's immutable he's unchangeable and he's the Lord who's present a very present help today in times of trouble you know it's funny how people that say that don't praise him for what he's done just praise him for who he is I mean how do you even successfully do that I mean strip the things Jesus did in the gospel strip them all out of the gospels rip them tear them out of your bible and then find out what you're left with you're, you're left with a few good sermons and and that's pretty much it but jesus in john 2 when he turned the water into wine this this beginning of signs and wonders did jesus in cana of galilee and manifested his glory the signs and wonders he did was a manifestation of the glory and power of god so when you praise god for what he's done you're praising god for who he is you can't separate the two so don't let that garbage get into your head make you feel bad for thanking God that he's a healer make you feel bad for thanking God that he's a provider for thanking God that he's a deliverer from depression that he's our peace you know the Bible doesn't say that God brings peace he says he is the prince of peace I don't just thank God for the peace he's given me though the Bible says he gives us peace he's the prince of peace he lives in me he dwells in me and that peace of God overflows into every aspect of my life can you shout hallelujah? Praise him with the trumpet. Praise him with the lute and the harp. Praise him with the timbrel. Praise him with the dance. If you're just joining me now, please share the broadcast. You'd be a great help to me. This is going to help a lot of people today. Praise him with loud cymbals. Praise him with clashing cymbals. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. So I want to get into this. The last verse of Psalm 150 says, let everything that has breath praise the Lord. So people think, well, I don't really have anything to praise God for. You have breath, then you have something to praise God for. You know, Bishop David Oyedepo in Nigeria, the founder of the largest church in the world right now, said that if you've lost anything, it's because of God that you haven't lost everything. I'm going to repeat that. If you have lost anything, it's because of God that you haven't lost everything. And so when people think I have nothing to praise God for, there's nothing that I'm seeing that's worthy of lifting my hands and thanking God for, you're a fool. You haven't understood that the very reason there's breath in your lungs, a beat in your heart. You might be sick and your organ, maybe your, your heart's failing or your lungs are failing. You're not entitled to receive healing in your heart if you haven't thanked him for the health in your pancreas or the health in your liver. Why don't you start focusing on what's working for you instead of always focusing on what's working against you? Why don't you thank God that your children are fed, fed that there's food on your table, that there's shelter over your home? Instead of looking Looking to all the negativity that surrounds you, remember there's a God in heaven and his faithful promises that he's on standby ready to perform for you and start to thank God for the things that he's already done in your times past. That's the secret of David's success. Let me tell you something, and this should get into your spirit today. You are not qualified to upgrade your menu in the restaurant of heaven until you've adequately praised God for the menu you have right now. You are not qualified to have an upgraded menu 
until you've adequately praised God for the menu you have in front of you right now. You, can't, you are not qualified to receive further blessing if you haven't thanked God adequately for past, past blessing. That's why David, before he killed Goliath, he knew. Man, I'm, he, David wasn't stupid. He understood in the natural. He wasn't no match for Goliath. Goliath had been a warrior from his youth. Goliath stood nine foot six. Goliath had a spear that was like 13 feet tall he had a shield that was carried by like two people armor bearers he had a massive head uh, but david understood though in the flesh i'm no quali- i'm not qualified at all to fight this guy because if if anybody was qualified it'd be my older brother eliab who in the natural was he stood taller than all the rest saul was taller than all the rest but even St- saul hid out in his uh in his tent but david understood one thing He understood that he was anointed, A, and then B, that the same God that delivered him in times past from the paw of the bear, he said the same God, when Saul tried to discourage him and say, you shouldn't go out, he's going to clobber you, man, you're going to be minced meat for him. David replied, the same God who delivered me, he he reminded Saul and he was praising God for his past victories who delivered me from the paw of the bear is the same God that delivered me from the paw of the lion and is the same God that will deliver me from this present day opposition this uncircumcised Philistine when he successfully and adequately praised God for past victory God came on the scene to give him a present day victory and so if you've lost anything Quit complaining about what you've lost. Start to thank God for what he's brought to your life. Start to thank God for your children. Thank to thank, start to thank God for, for what he's done in your business, in your finances, the bankruptcies that you should have suffered, the sicknesses that should have killed you, the problems that should have weighed down on you. But God was always there as a present help, in a very present help in times of trouble. And though the mountains were going to collapse on you, though the waves were going to wash you out, you're still standing. You're still moving forward. You haven't given up and quit. You haven't grown weary and well doing. And the God who delivered you then is going to deliver you now. But you got to lift up holy hands without wrath or doubting and say, Lord, I believe that you haven't changed. I believe you're not done with me. I believe there's still better things ahead of me. And I'm not, I'm not going to throw in the towel. I'm going to tape the boxing gloves of my life. I'm getting back in the ring and I'm going to praise God, use it as a weapon. And I'm going to a deal a blow to the devil's work and I'm going to be victorious because you're the God who said you always lead me in triumph by Christ Jesus hallelujah turn with me to Acts chapter 16 I'll show you a good example of that Acts chapter 16 and verse uh let's start with verse verse um Acts chapter 16 starting with verse 16 Now it happened, as we went to prayer, this is uh, Silas and Paul, that a certain slave girl, possessed with a spirit of divination, met us, who brought her masters much profit by fortune telling. This girl followed Paul and us and cried out, saying, these men are the servants of the Most High, God, who proclaimed to us the way of salvation. And this she did for many days. But Paul, greatly annoyed, turned and said to the spirit, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And he came out that very hour. But when her master saw that her hope of profit was gone, you see, there's wicked people in this world. If you think everybody's out for your good intentions and they have a good heart and they really want to help you, you're deceived. The devil makes money off keeping people bound. People were making money off this slave girl who was probably in her teen, teen years because they were using her as, as she was possessed with a spirit of divination to take in money through her fortune telling. You know, why do you think strip clubs are all around the cities of America and Canada and throughout the world? Because the devil is actually funneling money into his operations through keeping people bound to I, uh, immorality, sexual immorality. You look at drug addicts. They're bound and there's wicked people making money off that. Why do you think governments are now trying to... To, um, to make pot, marijuana, and other harder drugs. In Canada, they're looking to legalize cocaine. They're looking to legalize uh, meth and all that. And, but to have it like um, governmentally regulated, 
because they realize there's so much billions of dollars. You know, you look at Pablo Escobar, the guy got super rich by himself funneling drugs into nations. And so the government's finally caught on to it and now they're trying to assume that position, that role of drug supplier, make it legal so that at least they can have their hands in the pot. They're not interested in keeping in getting people set free. Why do you think governments hate the gospel? Why do you think most governments, you look at any nation that communism has taken over in, the first thing that had to go was, was the Bible. The first thing that had to go was the scriptures. And lock up the preachers. Because the gospel does for free what the world can't do at all. The gospel sets people free for free. There's no charge to hear the gospel. That's why I can't get along with people that charge money to go to conferences. You know, they have like levels, $100 for a three-day conference to hear so-and-so preach. And if you'll pay $250, you'll get backstage access. And then if you get $500, you'll have a meet and greet with him. Well, you're special because Jesus did everything for free and they came to him for free, but you charge $500 for people to meet you. You must be real special. We should applaud you, you charlatan. I can't believe that it's even going on in the church. God, Paul said, I've made it my aim to present the gospel of God without charge. We're not to charge people to hear the gospel. The word of God came to me for free. And Jesus said, freely you've received, now freely give it. You can bet your buck on it. There'll never be a time where there will be an entrance fee to come into any of my meetings. You can come for free. You can get set free for free. And you can leave free for free. Can you shout hallelujah? But the wicked, they make money off of it. They, they get rich. The devil gets rich off keeping people bound. But when Paul and Silas showed up, in one minute, they were greatly annoyed, said, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And he came out, the demon, that very hour. And her masters saw that their hope of profit was gone, and they seized Paul and Silas, dragged them into the marketplace to the authorities. And they brought them to the magistrates and said, these men being Jews, trouble our city and they teach customs which are not lawful for romans to receive or observe then the multitudes rose up together against them and the magistrates tore up their clothes and commanded them to be beaten with rods they didn't care about that they didn't care for paul and silas three four five weeks before the moment that their hope of profit was destroyed because that lady was set free now they cared they didn't care that they didn't care about roman uh, laws they didn't care about judaic laws they didn't care about any of that they just were ticked that that lady that was bringing them much money was set free and when they laid many stripes on them they threw them into prison commanding the jailer to keep them secured having received such a charge they threw them into the inner prison and fastened their feet in the stocks but at midnight Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God and the prisoners were listening to them Suddenly, there was a great earthquake, so that the foundation of the prison was shaken, and immediately all the doors were opened, and everyone's chains were loosed. And the keeper of the prison, awakening from sleep, seeking, seeing the prison doors open, supposing the prisoners had fled, drew his sword, and was going to kill himself. But call, Paul called him called to him with a loud voice saying, do yourself no harm for we are all here. Then he called for a light, ran in and fell down trembling before Paul and Silas. And he brought them out and said, sirs, what must we do to be saved? They said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you and your house will be saved. And they spoke the word of the Lord to him and all who were in the house. And they were baptized that very night, him and his family and when he had brought him into the house, he set food before them and rejoiced, having believed in God with all his household. So here you have a story of Paul and Silas going to a certain area, and they, they, they're in the ministry, they're working for God, they're seeing signs and wonders happen, they're on the move, they've given their lives to the gospel of Jesus Christ, they have denied themselves, pick up their crosses, and they have gone, they have received the command that Jesus said, go ye therefore and preach, and they followed it to the T. All of a sudden, they deliver this slave girl from a spirit of divination. And instead of being commended, instead of a revival breaking out, quite the opposite happened. And they're thrown into the inner, inner prisons and their feet and hands were fastened with stocks, the Bible says. 
in the inner prison. We're not talking about a Swedish prison where they had Xbox and, and food and a kitchen where they can come, all the inmates, and they had a certain level of freedom within the prison. We're talking about a first century prison, which was like a pit dug out of a cave, and they would throw people in into the inner caverns where it wasn't air conditioned or heated. It was rain you know drops of water dripping on their head it was dark it was gloomy it was cold and above all that they were in the inner dungeon not just in the outer dungeon not where they can have a at least they can see the light it was pitch black they weren't making things easy for these prisoners where they had torches lighting up and they could see everything. They were in the pitch black. They were in dark of dark nights. They were in the midnight hour, the Bible says. If there was ever a time where they could throw their hands down and complain and start to talk about everything that's come against them, everything that's destroyed them, everything that, you know, we've been on the go for God and this is how God repays us. After everything we've done, this is what we get. Oh man, I'm just going to quit. Silas, after this is done, if I, you know, tomorrow, I'm just going to say I recant Jesus. I'm going to move on. I'm going to go back to whatever I was doing before. I'm going to tell Peter he should go back to fishing boats, fishing fish out of boats, because really, you know, there's really nothing good that comes from this Jesus. There's nothing good. That, no, when they had the opportunity to do that, it's easy in the flesh to complain. It's easy. When they were in the desert, in the wilderness, the Israelites complained because they were only eating manna. And then the God gave them, uh, they gave him, God gave him quail and fish, um, birds, meat for them to eat. And then they still found something to complain. If you let your flesh just go, you're always going to gravitate towards complaining about everything. You can have a million things to be thankful for, but if you have a complaining spirit, you're going to find the one thing that you're not thankful for. These people are miserable. I've met them. Man, God can heal their body. God can heal their ear of deafness. I've seen it happen. A lady got healed of a deaf ear and as she's walking out her grandson comes to her and says man isn't it wonderful how God healed your ear you know what she said well I just hope it sticks the moment she said that her ear came closed again she went deaf again because God cannot stand he does not put up with complainers it irritates God if you read 1 Corinthians chapter 10, it says, don't complain as some of them complain and were destroyed by the destroyer. Don't murmur as some of them murmured. In the Bible says, in Numbers 21, they complained against God. They complained against Moses and the Lord sent out fiery serpents he allowed fiery serpents to latch on their legs and on their ankles and on their wrists and there was a great pandemic that spread through the entire israeli camp and only when they looked to the substitute the symbol of jesus at that cross when they looked to the brazen serpent on the wooden pole were they healed and were they forgiven but they complained and the bible says god was aroused unto anger against them so there's a lot of people that like Paul and Silas you're in the midnight hour and there's a desire there is a a temptation to complain your flesh wants to do it but if you'll do like Paul and Silas did they refuse to complain and then not only that they put they switched on praise see they prayed and when prayer didn't work I'm going to tell you something if your prayers are not baptized in praise, they are not going to be answered. For your prayers to be effective, they have to be baptized in praise. I like to call it a prayer a praise, uh, a prayer and praise sandwich. You know, you in a sandwich, in a hamburger, let's say, you have the bun, then you have the meat, and then you have another bun. Well, the Bible says in Psalm 100 and verse uh, 3 and 4, it says, that we are to enter his gates with thanksgiving in our hearts and enter his courts with praise. So you can't even enter into the gate of heaven and appear before God to have your prayers even heard unless you first and foremost adequately praise God with a high voltage praise. If you just enter in like a machine gun prayer and you just start da, 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 just going in, God, I can't believe this is happening. You need to do something about this. You'll never be heard. God's ears are closed. The Bible says, Here, He who turns away his ears from hearing the word of the law, his prayer is an abomination to God. And part of the word of the law is to enter his gates with thanksgiving in your heart. We read it in Ephesians 5. We are to in everything give thanks unto God in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, for this is the will of God. 
You, the Bible says, when you have done the will of God, then you can receive the promise. Until you have done the will of God to praise Him and thank Him and be grateful for what you have and what He's done, you'll never be qualified to receive the promise. You can't be confident that you'll ever receive the promise. You can't come into he heaven's throne, throwing your fist and swinging your fist, just angry about everything that's gone wrong in your life and expect God to move on your behalf. That's how people pray. And they do a lot of prayer like that. And then they get disappointed and discouraged even further because all of their prayers, they I've prayed three hours a day, I prayed five. You can pray five hours a day like that. But the scripture says when they pray, they pray amiss. And the Bible says, let not that person expect to receive anything from the Lord. So there's a right way to pray and there's a wrong way to pray. There's a right way to enter into the presence of God you think I can just go in to the Oval Office today and just walk in without any clearance and just hey SS uh, Secret Service and just walk right in and get into the Oval Office and talk to the President today that can't happen there's a procession there's a way to access the Oval Office you have to go through a series of things and in the same vein if a human dignitary has the ability to set up a procession before you can access the president of a, na of a nation. How much more do you think there's a code of conduct in approaching God? I'm not saying there's wor we're works based that unless you've done this, this, and this, you can't have access to God. No, I'm not saying that. However, I am saying that God in his word, by his sovereignty, has instituted a code of conduct in approaching him. And he said, enter his gates with thanksgiving. You look at when Jesus came to the tomb of Lazarus and was going to raise Lazarus from the dead. He... He followed his own code of conduct. He didn't just come to Lazarus' tomb and say, Mary, Mary, there's no, Mary and Martha, there's no reason to remove the stone. Just, I'll, I'll, I'll remove the stone by myself and I'll call Lazarus forth by myself. And so he just got there and he just blinked his eye and he said, Lazarus, come forth. And then Lazarus came forth and, and all of a sudden his hands and ankles were all unbound and he was happy and rejoicing. That's not how it worked. The first thing Jesus said was to remove the stone from the place where Lazarus was. That was expectation. You can't enter into heaven with, uh, to heaven's throne. You can't enter into the presence of God without having expectation. What's the point of praying if you don't expect God to even do what you're praying about? It's just empty air. Jesus said, don't be like religious people who they think by their many words they'll be heard. Who they think that if they have vain repetition that they'll be heard. It's not about how much you pray or how many words you have in prayer. It's about the level of faith that you have that you're exerting from your spirit when you pray. It's not about the quality of words and eloquence of speech that you have in prayer that gets God's attention. It's the quality of faith that you employ in prayer that gets God's attention. And so when he told La uh, Mary and Martha to roll the stone away, they said the body stinks. You see, that was doubt. That was them saying, why am I going to do that? His body stinks and there's no hope of him coming back to life. But Jesus said, did I not tell you already that if, if you... If you believe that you would see the resurrection of the dead. Mary and Martha did like every other Christian these days does. Oh yes, one day in the resurrection of the just, he'll be raised from the dead. Jesus said, no, we're not talking about some future event. Religion always postpones things to a future event. One day you'll be healed. One day you'll be saved. One day you'll be delivered. One day you'll be set free from sin. The Bible, Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. And all you got to do is receive me in my word. And you don't have to wait till heaven because death is not your savior. Savior, Jesus, I, Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. I am the bread of life. He that believes on me, he'll never hunger. He that feeds off me will never thirst. And so he said, no, we're not waiting till then. Roll the stone away now, and I'm going to do a miracle now. When she did that in expectation and faith, then Jesus proceeded to do what? He got to the tomb, and before he called Lazarus forth, he lifted up his hands, looked towards heaven, and he said, Father, I thank you. I thank you that you hear me. And I know that you always hear me. But for the sake of them standing by, I thank you now publicly. When he thanked God, then resurrection power came. And he called Lazarus forth and Lazarus came forth bound. But he said, loose him and let him go. Until you thank God that you're alive. And start focusing and zoning in. On what you do have. The things that are dead will remain dead. The things that are down will remain down. If you're ungrateful, you'll stay grounded. 
You'll stay at level one. We've heard it many times, I'm sure. It's a pretty good Christian cliche or Christian slogan that people use. It's if you are... Uh, it's your attitude that determines your altitude. And so if your attitude is that of ungratefulness, you will stay grounded. You'll stay at level one. You'll not move forward. You look at it in um, Michael, David's wife, Michal, Michael, however you want to pr pronounce it. When David captured the Ark of the Covenant from the Philistines camp and was bringing it back into Jerusalem, he began to dance before the Lord with all his might. And the Bible says his wife came out and said, is this, the king? is this how the king of Israel should be conducting himself? Is this dignified for a king? You've been dancing? Man, I even saw your ankles showing and all the servant girls have been looking and they've been lusting after those ankles. You know, like I'm sure she, it's not in the scriptures, but I'm sure that she got angry or something. I don't know. She might've been jealous. I'm sure that's the way a king's supposed to conduct himself. Look at this. Real dignified of you, David. You know what David said? Don't you know what God did in bringing back the Ark of the Covenant? You see, the Ark of the Covenant was the presence of God on the earth. When David was dancing, he was dancing because the presence of God was returning back to the Jews. It was returning back to cause the Jews to flourish. When it was at Obed-Edom's house, everything in Obed-Edom's house began to flourish, began to grow, began to increase. He was super happy because he knew that God's presence in my life shows that where I'm at now is the lowest that I'll ever be. That the last defeat I suffered will be the last defeat I ever suffer. Now that God's presence is back, I'm on a path of victory. I'm on a path path of triumph and I'm on a pathway whose trajectory is upward and forward and so because Michael complained about David's praise you see whenever someone complains about the way you praise God oh they yell too loud oh they lift their hands too high oh they dance too much oh they play too hard oh they jump too high it's because they don't understand the joy of salvation when you start to see and understand that had it not been the Lord I know there's people here watching me today and those on the replay that you understand had it not been the Lord that was on my side I would have been devoured and dismayed I would have been kicked to the curb slaughtered and messed up I would have been an open prey for the devil to latch his teeth on and tear me to shreds but God was the one who stood by me who shut the mouths of lions who quenched the violence of fire who out of weakness made me strong and so because they don't understand your story they don't know your praise and they don't understand your praise don't let somebody dictate the level of heat that you exert in worship they don't know what you know about God they've not gone through what you've gone through with God that when you walk through the fire it didn't burn you when you walk through the waters it didn't drown you when you walk through the rivers it didn't overflow you so don't let the Michaels in your life try and squash your joy and gratitude for God and what he's done no try to be like David I will enter his courts with thanksgiving in my heart. I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise will continually flow from my mouth. I'm going to praise him with the dance. I'm going to praise him with the harp and the timbrel. I'm going to praise him with loud cymbals. I'm going to praise him with all that is within me. I'm going to bless the Lord for he has done great things for me. If that sounds like you, I want you to put the praise hand emojis in the comment section. Oh, I hear the roar of praise coming from your life and today just like in Acts chapter 16 everyone's prison doors came open everyone's shackles and chains came undone when you decide to praise God despite the circumstance you're facing today God will move heaven and earth cause an earthquake to happen break you free from every prison cell that hell and sin has kept you in and not only are you going to be free the Bible says even the prisoners that were in that prison cell that graveyard were free free your praise not only has the ability to get you out of the prison but it's gonna set your family free it's gonna set your children free you can set up an environment and an atmosphere in your home that is conducive for God's spirit and when God's spirit is there the spirit of the Lord there is freedom that freedom is coming to your house today the prison cell of sickness is opening over your house today 
You're coming free from sickness. The prison cell of depression is being opened in your house today and you're coming free from that depression. The prison cell of destruction and every agent of hell that's been assigned to your life to keep that prison cell closed is being opened today and you're marching on free for whom the sun sets free is free indeed. In Jesus' name. Oh, hallelujah. I feel like preaching today. The devil might have had the first laugh in your life, but God and you are going to have the last laugh. God and you are going to have the last laugh. They were expecting to have Paul and Silas executed in the morning, but when God's presence came into that prison cell, the Bible says that even if a physical, let me ask you a question, if the physical cell could not keep them bound, how much more can spiritual prison cells be opened as you adequately open up your mouth and praise God. If it can open up physical cells and open up and unhinge and unlatch physical chains, how much more can spiritual chains be broken as you engage God in a praise session? Some of you have prayed far too much for the situation you're facing. You haven't turned on praise and that's why you're still bound. Because the Bible says, be anxious for nothing but in everything through prayer supplication and thanksgiving and thanksgiving the greatest expression of faith in prayer is you're praising God about what you've prayed about you see when the Israelites came to Jericho God said march around it seven times and on the seventh day do it seven times again and on the seventh time blow the, the trumpet and then I'll give you victory. Had they just sat there and said, well, let's just pray about it. We just need to get, get the mind of God on this. We don't know what the way out is of this. We need to, we need to really uh, demolish those walls. And we don't have the necessary artillery to actually take down those fortified walls. But we're going to pray God would supply everything that we need. If they had done that, they there would be no story of Jericho. That would have been the end of Israel. Instead, they followed the instruction to do what God had said to do. To praise Him. And on the seventh day, the seventh time, they blew the trumpet. And the Bible says they cried out and shouted out in praise, very loud and very high. And the Bible says the walls of Jericho came down. You notice how the walls of Jericho didn't come down and then they decided to praise? They didn't wait for the walls to come down before they started to open up their mouth. They praised God in the present and God caused the wind to blow and tore down those walls supernaturally. Quit waiting for things to change on the outside before you start to praise God on the outside. Instead, praise God and you'll see that God will move on your behalf because praise is an invitation that God will never turn down. Praise will turn your battle over into God's hands and God never loses a battle. God has never lost a battle and you're not special enough to screw up his track record. When you praise God, you are successfully transmitting the battle that's in your hands into God's hands. And we know that cancer is no match for God. We know that depression is no match for God. We know that multiple cirrhosis is no match for God. I'll tell you a testimony. There was a lady on the South Shore of Montreal. I was preaching one day. She had fibromyalgia and excruciating pain and had to have a walker to get her into church that night. When I preached on praise and I had them do a praise session at the end of the sermon, you know, I don't just preach for people to hear a good message and have a golf clap and then return to their seat. We're going to act on what God's told us to do from his word, including praising God and so I had a praise session I got people for like half an hour 45 minutes they were dancing before the Lord with all their might well she ended up coming back I think that was like on the Monday or Tuesday she came back a couple of days later was no longer on medication no longer using her walker and she was jumping in the service running around totally set free not a pain in her body and a cup uh, she she ended up going for a walk with her her, uh, her daughter or her granddaughter that day at the mall, and she said, confess, out of her own mouth, after about five minutes usually, ten minutes of walking, I'd have to take at least a two-minute break just to recalibrate. I walked for over an hour, and it was my granddaughter that had to take a, a, a rest, I had to take a break because she was, she was getting tired. Hallelujah. 
That's what praise did for her. It reversed the irreversible thing that fibromyalgia had done to her body. Look at what it did for Lazarus. If you think your high blood pressure is a problem to God, when Jesus praised God for Lazarus' resurrection before he called his name forth, not only did, Jesus, not only did Lazarus have ba bad blood pressure problems, he had no blood pressure. He had, his blood was turning black. But when he praised God, it turned that blood back to normal and gave him a regulated blood pressure. I want you to understand this. Lazarus died of sickness. He was in a sickness that resulted in death. When Jesus healed him, it didn't just give him back life, but he still was sick and he died a few days later. Everything that sickness had done to his body was totally restored. When you begin to choose to praise God, and I said choose because praise is not a feeling that comes on you. It's a decision. David said, I will bless the Lord. I will praise the Lord with every Everything that is within me, bless the Lord, oh my soul. Your soul is not your spirit. It's not your body. Your soul is your emotions. It's your will. It's your ability. That's where you have the ability to choose, to determine. It's in your soul called faculty. And David didn't say, bless the Lord, oh my spirit. David didn't say, bless the Lord, oh my flesh. He said, bless the Lord. Oh, my soul, saying, I'm choosing to praise God no matter what I'm seeing. Lazarus wasn't only raised back to life when, he, when Jesus decided to praise God, even though his friend Lazarus had died. Remember, Lazarus even wept. Uh, Jesus even wept over Lazarus. He cared about Lazarus. But the Bible says Lazarus was not only raised to life, he was totally restored in his body. Whatever organs had failed, restored back to life. Whatever had happened in his brain, whether it was a tumor, who knows what it was. Everything came back to the original function I tell you in the name of Jesus as you engage God in a high voltage praise today everything the devil's damaged in your body God is not only going to restore you will without fail recover everything that the devil has stolen from you first Samuel chapter 30 the Bible says David and his army went to war when they came back they found out that the Amalekites had ransacked and burnt up their camp at Ziglag and even their children and women had been been captive, held captive, kidnapped. And so they came back and were very angry and they began to weep and they wept loudly for many, many hours. All night they wept loudly until there was no more power to weep. And I want you to notice something. When they wept, it didn't change their situation. When they wept, it didn't cause God to move or intervene. When they wept, it did not ameliorate or improve on their conditions. When you weep about your problems, it doesn't increase you or help you. It actually is just exalting the devil's work. When you weep and cry and complain about what the devil's done to you, you're just adding trophy after trophy into the devil's trophy case of misery. But the thing the devil can't stand is in the midst of a time like that. I mean, as bad as things might be for you, hopefully you're not like David who had a real bad where his own children and his wife had been taken captive and kidnapped. At least you still have your children at least you still have your wife at least you still have your family this guy lost it all and the bible says after he had wept david had an idea i'm going to encourage myself in the lord i'm going to strengthen myself in the lord he did what he couldn't do or he didn't what he didn't want to do sometimes when you don't know what to do you got to do what you don't want to do sometimes when you i'm going to repeat that when you don't know what to do you have to do what you don't necessarily want to do and david and encouraged himself in the Lord. He started to, I'm sure he started to quote Psalm 27. The Lord is my light and my salvation. Psalm 3, he is my crown. He is my glory. He's the lifter of my head. I'm sure he started to quote Psalm, uh, Psalm, uh, Psalm 27 where at the end of the chapter it says, I will see the goodness of the Lord while I'm yet in the land of the living. I know that goodness and mercy is going to follow me all the days of my life. I know that God, you're a good shepherd and you said you'd lead me forward by the right way that even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death I will fear no evil for your rod and your staff they do comfort me you prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies I know that my tomorrow is going to be all right because I know that I'm doing what you've called me to do today he began to strengthen himself in the Lord what happened after that then God spoke and said take the ephod when he did he began to hear instructions from God and the Lord said to him now go by the certain way and 
and you will find the Amalekites dwelling by that way. You shall engage them in battle, for I will be with you to deliver the people out of their hand, and you shall without fail recover all. Hallelujah. Though the fig tree has not blossomed in your life, though there be no calves in the stall, though it seems like the enemy has thrown his best at you, his best will not be enough. If you'll do what Habakkuk says, yet in this I will praise the Lord. Yet in this I will joy in the God of my salvation. God's not abandoned you. God's not forsaken you. God's not thrown you to the curb. God's not looked uh, looked over you or overlooked you. God is still ready and willing to deliver you today. Habakkuk says, yet in this I will joy in the God of my salvation and he will make my feet like hinds feet to ride on the high places of the earth. God has a Hallelujah. God said, I will make your feet like deer's feet. Though your feet might be weak now because of what you've suffered in the last year, when you praise God, you'll actually get supernatural power to run and not grow weary, to walk and not faint in Jesus' name. I want to read something out of Zephaniah. Listen to what the Bible says in the book of Zephaniah. Zephaniah chapter 3. If you're just joining me now, welcome. Please help me by sharing this broadcast. It's going to help a lot of people. Zephaniah chapter 3. Listen to this. Verse 14. Sing, O daughter of Zion. Shout, O Israel. Sing, O daughter of Zion. That's the church. Shout, O Israel. Be glad and rejoice with all your heart, O daughter of Jerusalem. For the Lord has taken away your judgments. He has cast out your enemy. The king of Israel, the Lord, is in your midst. He, you shall see disaster no more. Hallelujah. Why should you sing? Because you will see disaster no more. You might be surrounded by disaster right now. But when you make a decision to sing, God says, I'm going to overthrow the work of the devil. And from today, you shall see disaster no more. In that day will be said of Jerusalem. Don't be afraid. Zion, don't let your hands be weak. That's God's word for you today. Stop being afraid. Stop being afraid. Stop making the devil happy by dwelling in fear. Well, I don't know what I don't know what's gonna happen with this. You know, the doctor said this. Stop letting your mouth. You might have thoughts of fear. Jehoshaphat was surrounded by three armies: the Moabites, the Ammonites, and Mount Seir. And the scripture says he feared and set himself to seek the Lord. Fear is gonna happen. No matter how anointed you are, no matter how great of a man of God. Uh, someone might be he's not exempt from feeling fear time to time you can hear bad news you might feel fear but the difference between great warriors of faith and those that succumb or fall prey and victim to the devil is that the warriors of faith have understood how to cast down the spirit of fear from their mind they know how to cast down or take captive every thought of fear that might rise up in their hearts that's what the bible says right here don't be afraid don't let your hands be weak and then the thought you have to rather replace with the thought of fear is this. The Lord your God is in your midst. The mighty one will save. I'm not going to give up and quit. He that began a good work in me is going to complete it to the day of Jesus Christ. He will rejoice over me with gladness. God is going to quiet me with his love. He will rejoice over me with singing. I will gather. This is God's word. I will gather those who sorrow over the appointed assembly who are among you, to whom its reproach is a burden. Behold, at the time, hallelujah, I will deal with all who afflict you. God is going to deal with all your enemies today. Every enemy of your destiny, every enemy of your body, every enemy called sickness, every enemy of your finances. You know what the scripture says? That God inhabits the praises of his people. And the Lord says in Psalm 94, that when the Lord arises, every enemy shall be scattered. When you got adopted into the family of God, your enemies became God's enemies. Your adversaries became God's adversaries. So anything that has made a decision to war against you has made a decision to war against God. And God doesn't lose wars. Anything that makes a decision to war against God God has made a decision to fail. So I tell you, be encouraged today. Everything that's afflicting you, God said, I will deal with all that afflict you. Oh, be, be content and rejoice. That's why Paul said in Philippians, when he was in prison, he kept encouraging the Philippians, don't in any way be terrified of your adversaries, for it will be a sign of to them of destruction, but to you of salvation. Therefore, rejoice in the Lord. And again, I say rejoice. And again, I 
say rejoice. Rejoice in the Lord always. The Bible says clap all you hands and shout unto God with a voice of triumph. For it is he that avenges those that deal and avenge his people. God will silence the enemies in your life. God is going to shut the door on sickness in your life. God is going to shut the door on depression in your life. God is going to shut the door on anxiety in your life. God is going to shut the door on marital distress in your life. God is going to shut the door on financial poverty in your life. God is going to shut the door on everything the devil has designed to destroy you. God is going to deal with all who afflict you. And he says, I will save the lame. I will gather those who are driven out. I will appoint them for praise and fame in every land that they were put to shame. I'm going to read that part again. Because this, man, when this got into my spirit a few years back, it just, it, it, I still remember it. It lit me up. God said, I will appoint you for, for praise and for fame in every land where you were formerly put to shame. So, <coughs> A good illustration of this is Mark chapter 10, verses 46 to 52. The Bible says there was a man called Blind Bartimaeus. They didn't even call him Bartimaeus. They called him Blind Bartimaeus. Blindness had put shame on his life. He was a beggar. He sat by the roads begging. And the Bible says they even gave him a garment, a garment that identified him as a legitimate beggar. He was an object of shame. He was a stain on his family tree. He was viewed as a curse that nobody wanted any dealings with. And the Bible says, when Jesus walked by his way, blind Bartimaeus shouted out, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. See, son of David is not just some, you know, term or some title Jesus had that people, you know, they just started calling him in that day. They just said, he must be the son of, he the son of David. Sounds good. It's like a nice, a nice cute title that Jesus had and he, he went by himself. Son of David was an Old Testament prophecy that the bible says the son of david would be the messiah the anointed one when he was calling on son of david jesus son of david he was praising god for sending the anointed one he was praising jesus for being the healer the deliverer son of david that little three word uh, title that blind bartimaeus attributed to christ was his way of praising god he was saying he wasn't saying jesus regular guy he wasn't saying jesus oh uh healer he wasn't just saying jesus good teacher rabbi he said jesus son of david he recognized his position as messiah and so that was his praise he was blind bartimaeus was saying jesus i recognize you as the messiah i recognize you as the healer i praise you as the anointed one have mercy on me when he did that the crowds told him to shut up i told you there's going to be people that want to shut your praise down they want to quiet you down they want to siphon your praise the fuel of your praise they want to squash you and belittle you and berate you and make sure that there's no praise in you because they lack praise they want you to lack praise because their fire went out they want your fire to go out but blind Bartimaeus had another spirit in him and he didn't put up with that crap he didn't keep on he said Jesus thou son of David all the more have mercy on me when he praised God like that the scripture says Jesus stood still in his tracks and he couldn't ignore the cry of praise he could not ignore the cry of praise And he stood still and called for Bartimaeus to come to him. You see, praise is the element that hacks into heaven's mainframe and puts you as number one on God's calendar. Jesus wasn't planning on healing blind Bartimaeus that day. He was going somewhere else. But when blind Bartimaeus praised God, it hacked into God's computer and said, no, no, we're actually restructuring today's schedule. Blind Bartimaeus is up to bat. And the Bible says Jesus called him to himself. And he said, what do you want me to do for you? See, praise, almost, when you praise God, God will give you a blank check signed with the name of Jesus, backed by the resources of heaven, that you can fill out with anything that's outlined in scripture, and God will give it to you. Blind Bartimaeus said, I want to receive my sight. What do you want me to do for you, Jesus said. Not what do you need. Blind Bartimaeus didn't need his sight. You don't don't die of blindness. He could have lived on blind. He could have lived a long life blind. 
He didn't need his sight. So don't let that religious jargon get into your spirit. God doesn't give you what you want. He gives you what you need. That's not true because Jesus didn't say, what do you need, blind Bartimaeus? And blind Bartimaeus, well, I would like my sight, but I know you, you know what I need best. And so Jesus just blessed him and said, Father, I just give him, I just pray you'd give him joy to keep on in this blindness, just joy to persevere. He didn't do that. What do you want me to do? I need my sight back. Jesus said, as you believe, let it be done to you. He touched his eyes and his eyes opened up. And blind Bartimaeus, his shame, in every place that he was considered an object of shame, he was now the talk of the town. That's what Zephaniah 3 says. In every place that you were appointed as an object of shame, in every land where you were put to shame, when you praise God, the Bible says God will lift you up out of that pit of despair and he'll make you the talk of the town where you're now the, uh, an object of praise and of glory. Where now, I'm not saying people are worshiping you. I'm saying people are blessing God on your behalf. That's why the Bible says in Psalm 126, when the captives were brought back to Zion, they were like those that dream. Let me read it. Psalm 126. When the captives... When the Lord brought the captives back to Zion, they were like those that dream. And our mouths were filled with laughter and our tongues with joyful singing. And they said among the nations, the Lord has done great things for them. The Lord has done great things for us and we are glad. That's not other Christians thanking God on behalf of what he's done for you, that's other heathen nations recognizing that would have been impossible unless there was God behind that. Scripture says that's what praise does for you. Takes you out of the realm of shame and defeat and discouragement and, and curse and constant battle. And God puts you into the realm where now everybody's saying, what great things the Lord has done for you. I tell you in the name of Jesus. I prophesy to everyone that will receive it today. By the end of this year, the people that told you, where is your God? Where is your God now? What has all your worship to that God done for you in any day of your life? All those people will change their tune on you and they'll begin to declare, the Lord has done great things for you. And they'll have no choice but to say, God is alive and Jesus must be his son. Because I've not seen anybody receive such a story of turnaround the way you have in Jesus' name. If you're able to receive that in your spirit today, just shout, I receive it. Write it down in the comment section. I receive it. We're going to pray now. Before I do, the Bible says in Isaiah 61 that when the Spirit of the Lord is upon you, He anoints us to preach deliverance to the captives, to give recovery of sight to the blind, to mend the brokenhearted, and then instead of your ashes, I'll give you beauty, God said. By the anointing, instead of your sorrow, I'll give you the oil of joy and gladness. And then it says, instead of the spirit of heaviness, I'll give you the garment of praise. The number one prerequisite for praise to be received by God in heaven is this, joy. It's joy. In his presence is fullness of joy. At his right hand is pleasures forevermore. Until you are genuinely joyful, your praise will not be received in heaven. Remember the Bible says it is a sacrifice of praise. And God does not receive every sacrifice. We can see that in Cain and Abel. He refused Cain's sacrifice. He received Abel's sacrifice. For your sacrifice of praise to be received in heaven, you have to have a heart filled with gratitude and joy that backs it. And you can't have joy by yourself. The Bible says you need the oil of joy to be poured out on you. It's a spiritual thing. Happiness is based on happenings. You can be happy one day and, and sad the next. Joy is contingent or tied to the anointing of the Holy Spirit. That's why the Bible says the kingdom of heaven is not in meat and drink, but it's in peace, righteousness, and joy in the Holy Ghost. Only the Holy Ghost can impart joy, genuine, 
heaven sent joy into your life. And I today take authority over every root of depression in your life, every spirit of heaviness, every foul devil of depression, every satanic agency and entity that has been sent to sow seeds of discouragement in your heart. I uproot those seeds. I cast down every thought of depression. And I release, I turn loose into your spirit. Joy unspeakable and full of glory. From the top of your head to the soles of your feet. You are anointed with fresh oil today. The Bible says the oil is the oil of gladness. The oil of gladness. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise will transport you right into the presence of God where sickness can't live, depression can't live, sorrow can't live. Because in his presence is fullness of joy. At his right hand is pleasures forevermore. As heaven fills your heart with joy and you lift your hands, I want you to take, whether it be now, I don't know if you're at work, whatever, it be now or sometime today, I want you to take 15 or 30 minutes. Put on some happy praise music. You'll never have joy. God can fill you with joy right now. But you'll never sustain that joy and maintain that joy in your life or grow that joy in your life. If you keep your lights in your house super dark, all your windows are closed in, and you watch the Lifetime Music uh, Movie Network for hours a day where it's just movies of people going through tragedy. There's this, mo- there's this show called This Is Us. All I got was a glimpse of it. I, I-, I listened to like two minutes of it. And I was like, this is, this is not us. This is... This is despair. This is not us. This is depressing. To call it, this is depressing. It's like it imparts depression into people. All it is is sad stories and miserable. Don't expose yourself and overexpose yourself to misery and then expect to live in joy. Instead, do what the Bible says. Guard your heart above all things. Let your light house be filled with light. Put on anointed worship music. Not worship music that just talks about what the worship leader went through in the last year. It's some songs. It's, just, it's literally, it, why are you reading your diary and tying a, a, a cute rhythm to it? So some people's worship uh, version of worship is. They're just reading their diary, how hard things have been, and then they add a really nice tune to it so it catches, because Christians are really, most Christians are not spiritual enough to be sensitive to the anointing that's on the music. So they just, because it has a nice beat, they, they just, they'll sing it. They'll mouth it off. Instead, get, get good, anointed, old-fashioned songs that'll build joy into your heart. There's some songs I could recommend. There's a song by Bishop G.E. Patterson. That's, uh, it's a very simple one. Maybe you know it. Glory, glory, hallelujah. Since I laid my burdens down. Glory, glory, Hallelujah. Since I laid my burdens down. There's another song by Bishop G.E. Patterson. It's like old, old time, strong Pentecostal songs, but they're amazing. There's an anointing of joy on those songs. One of them is one of my favorites. It says, uh, what more can he do? What more can he do? He laid the foundations, opened up the heavens. What more can he do? What more can he do? What more can he do? He laid the foundations, opened up the heavens. What more can he do? There's another song I love. It's called Jesus is on the main line. Tell him what you want. Jesus is on the main line. Tell him what you want. If healing is what your body needs, tell him what you want. Jesus is on the main line. Tell him what you want. What you want. And there's a bunch of songs I can recommend from that man. Look him up on Spotify or YouTube, whatever. Those are good songs. And you'll see, you can set up an atmosphere in your home where like a fish can't survive out of water, the devil will not be able to to cohabitate, coexist in your home because he can't survive an atmosphere of praise. 
Like a fish can't survive out of water. Like a bird can't survive in the water. The devil cannot survive a, a, an atmosphere of praise. The last sign of the devil's presence in your home ended yesterday. From today, the weapon of praise is going to blast out every satanic presence from your home. And you will see, like I read before, every place in which you were a, a place and in, in which you were identified as shame and as embarrassment, God is going to overturn the work of the devil and appoint you as an object of fame and glory from today. In the name of Jesus Christ, the devil has tried his, ble- his best. But his best was not enough because there's still breath in your lung. There's still a beat in your heart. There's still a praise in your spirit. And I prophesy in the name of Jesus, God's putting a new song in your mouth. And like Psalm 126 says, he's going to fill your mouth with joy and your tongue with joyful singing. And from morning till night, a song of exaltation from, shall rise from within in your, in your heart, in your home, in your life. In Jesus' mighty name, from the rising of the sun to its setting down, the name of the Lord shall be praised. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. If you're watching right now, if you've never given your life to Jesus, you need to do it right now. The Bible says only the living can praise the Lord. He that has the, the son has life. He that has not the son has no life. If you don't have Jesus in your heart, you don't have life. You're dead in sin. You're either dead in sin or dead to sin. In order for your praise to ascend into heaven, you need to be dead to sin but, and alive to God. And the way you do that is accepting Christ into your heart today. You don't have to question whether you'll make heaven or not. You can settle it today. Romans 10 and verses 9 and 10 says, If you believe in your heart and confess with your mouth, Jesus Christ is Lord, you'll be saved. You will be saved. And the Lord shows no partiality. He's the same Lord over Jew and Greek, rich and poor. He makes no distinction at all, but He is rich to all who call upon Him in faith. Call upon Jesus today. Pray this prayer with me. Say this with me. Say, Father... In Jesus' name, I believe you raised Jesus from the dead. I confess Christ is my Lord. I turn to you today. I ask you, forgive all my sins. Wash me clean. Where I was weak, by your spirit, make me strong. I thank you for sending your son Jesus to pay the debt I owed. And from today... I'll pay the debt that I owe. I'll praise you day in and praise you day out. I will live for you. Heaven is my home. God is my father. I'm never looking back. My sins are forgiven. I'm born again because I'm sincere right now. Jesus, make everything new in my life. And I'm thankful for it. In Jesus' name. Amen. If you prayed that prayer, I want you to get in contact with me. Go to my website, salvationnow.ca. The first link is I just got saved. Fill out that form. There's a link at the bottom for a YouTube video. Uh, Four things I would tell every Christian. If I had 30 minutes to sit down with you, it's the four things that I would impart into. I would tell you, I would instruct you to do so that you can guarantee that your walk with God is successful and that you make heaven. It's not just one uh, you know, momentary high. God's not, God didn't send Jesus to give you a five day relief. He sent Jesus for whom the Son sets free is free indeed. But there's things you have to do. Jesus said, if you abide in me and I abide in you, then you will bring forth much fruit. So abide in him. Uh, and I'm going to show you how you can do that by that YouTube video, salvationl.ca. The first link is I just got saved. Click it and fill out that information. For everyone else that's watching, thank you so much for tuning in today. I'm glad to be back in studio. I'm going to be here for a little while. I know the last three months it's been on and off because I've been in different places. Literally, I've only, I've only been home for two weeks and that was because I had to come home for quarantine so that I can, I can go to Saskatoon because the U.S. to Canada, there's still international quarantine laws in Canada. So that's the only reason why I, I, I was home for four, 14 days or else I would have... I would have been traveling all throughout that time anyway. So, um, 
But we're going to be home for a little bit for a little bit now. I feel in my spirit to stay home for a little bit now. And uh, so we're going to be doing these. You can sow, Victoria, thank you for asking, by going to salvationnow.ca slash give. I don't think, I, if you watch the, big, the video at the beginning of this broadcast, I don't think I have to convince you that when you sow into this ministry, our ministry has one purpose. It's to plunder hell and populate heaven. We're not playing religious games, tickling. You know, Jesus said, which woman who had 10 coins, if she loses one, does not leave the nine and go and find, sweeps that house, puts it in order until she finds that one coin. I'm not repolishing the nine coins over and over and over again. I'm following the Great Commission. I'm going after the lost coin. I'm leaving the 99. I'm, that's what the evangelist does. He leaves the 99 and goes after the one sheep that got away. And so if you'd like to partner with a ministry that does so, salvationl.ca slash give. You can become a monthly partner with us or you can sow a one-time gift. Whatever the Lord leads you to do, I would encourage you, obey Him. Do it. If the Lord says to sow and to give, it's not because He's trying to take from you. It's because He's trying to get more into your hand. God's not begging for money. God is not begging, but He's asking for faith. When you sow in faith, all of heaven's resources. The Bible says he owns all the silver and all the gold. He owns the cattle on a thousand hill. If he wanted your money, he wouldn't ask you for it. Heaven is paved with streets of gold. Our offering to God is not because we're trying to finance God's work. Whether people give or not, God is going to finance this work because he said, seek first the kingdom of God and everything else will be added to you. When you give and partner up with soul winning ministries, the grace of and the, uh, the fruit that abounds to my account now abounds to your account. Every soul that we bring in is a soul that you've brought in because there's one, the Bible says, how can there be a preacher unless he is sent? So there's people that are senders and there's people that are preachers. I'm a preacher and you're a sender. Everyone's either called to be a full-time preacher of the gospel or to send people in their stead. Now, I'm not saying you don't have a ministry wherever you're at in your work. You should be preaching the gospel no matter where you're at. But I'm talking about full time. There's the office of the ministry, the evangelist, pastor, teacher, apostle, prophet. Paul said, I don't seek the gift that you're giving. Because he was commending the Philippians that when we went out and set out for the gospel of God, nobody else partnered with us in giving and receiving except you. But I'm not bringing this up so that you can give more. I'm saying... I seek the fruit that now abounds to your account. I know that there's a reward for you, not only on this earth, but also in heaven. Giving not only produces a heavenly reward, it produces financial increase here and now. Don't believe me? I mean, you're going to have to rip a lot of scriptures out of the Bible. Because <laughs> the Bible says when that Z widow of Zarephath sold her last meal into Elisha's ministry, the Bible says that the bin of flour she had was never run dry. It never was used up. Neither was the jar of oil run dry. And she and he and her household ate for many days while the rest of the world was in a famine and in a drought. You look at Isaac. Isaac, who had the blessing of Abraham on him. He was the child of Abraham. He sowed in a famine and the Lord yield, uh, brought back a hundredfold increase that year for Isaac. There is a law in Genesis 6 called the law of seed, time, and harvest. You sow the seed. Then there's the time of faith, but it's always, when you do it in faith, when you do it in gratitude, God loveth a cheerful giver. When you do it with a cheerful heart, there's always going to be a time of harvest. But a farmer is not entitled to a harvest unless he sows the seed. So if you sow today, I want to thank you in advance. All those who have sowed and who partner with us on a monthly basis, I thank you from the bottom of my heart for partnering with us. I mean, I'm going to post that Hope Fest video, but let it bless you because... Every dollar that you've sowed has gone towards that. And future Hope Fest that we're doing next year, Lord willing, I want to do at least three Hope Fests. I want to do at least three Hope Fests next year, Lord willing. We're praying for all the restrictions to come down in Canada so we can get to work. But God gave us a little window in Saskatoon to do this one. And it was the best thing. 185 decisions for Christ. And then in the churches after, 45 decisions for Christ. No, 60, sorry, 60. We had 245 people come to the Lord. And by the way, all of those decisions are going to be made into disciples because we have a plan, a follow-up program that we do. We don't catch and release. We catch and we eat. Jesus said, I'll make you a fisher of men. 
We're not catching and releasing. We have a follow-up program. Each and every one of those people will receive at least three follow-up calls. That's been my instruction to the people on the ground in Saskatoon. There's four or five churches that have been given those decision cards, and they have instructions to call, visit, or email uh, every single person, depending on the information we have from the decision cards. Every single person, at least three points of contact. And so we're going to... And I've already had you know testimonies come in. There's a lady that contacted us just recently that she came night one on Hope Fest, brought her family night two, and the whole family saved and in the Lord right now. And God's done a great work. So we had whole family saved at this event. I've had other testimonies come in, which I'll, I'll probably, you know, if you go on my Instagram, I think they're all there. I, I don't know if they are, but I know, I think I did some on the stories. So it's only 24 hours, but I can rattle off for hours on what God did in those three days. People coming in, staggering through the streets, some people having no shirts on, looking through garbage one day, and then the next day clothed. It, it was powerful. One, one of the best three days of my life, for sure. And so salvationnow.ca slash give, if you'd like to partner with, with us in that. Um, God bless you all. Amanda Chick from North Carolina, God bless you and your husband. Acacia Luza Yangamo. I hope I pronounced that right. Kai Liv, God is amazing. Praise the Lord. Hope Fest, I will attend at least one. Never been to Canada and want to visit my neighbor. You're welcome to come. You're welcome to come. We had people drive in from, many people from four plus hours away to be in those three days, to volunteer, to help out. Thank you, Natasha. See that? I've partnered with this ministry and a few other soul winning ministries. Capital Soul Winning Ministries. And I can tell you God honored it and multiplies it. I had a guy tell me just this last weekend. He sold, um, he, he had a negative bank account. And I forget the exact story, but there was owed to him from the government uh, $2,000. And he had a negative bank account. So he, he ended up um, sowing like whatever he had in his hands. He had, I think he had a few more, he had some cash in his hands. He sold it all uh, last week. This week, I don't know if it was the government or an insurance agency. I'm really butchering the story. But anyways, one of them, I think it might have been an insurance agency. They owed him $2,000, but they were holding it off and holding it off for multiple months. And he had a negative bank account. He needed money to pay his bills. He sold last weekend, this, uh, sorry, two weekends ago, that week, the uh, insurance company called him and uh, because his friend had said, watch the Lord not only give you 2,000, but 10 times what 2,000 is, so 20,000. The insurance company called him and said, you not only are going to get the 2,000 in this upcoming deposit, but we're backtracking for 10 weeks or 10, yeah, 10, 10 payments. And we're going to give you a lump sum of 20,000 for all the problems we've caused you in the last, in the last little while. And we're just going to retroactively pay you it all uh, in this next payment. He had a deposit of 20, 22,000 odd dollars. He sowed a seed. I don't even know what the seed was. But God, you see, there's a devourer that comes to chew up your harvest. The Bible says that when you give, God rebukes the devourer and everything that's owed to you is released. Some people, there's things blocking the return. Give cheerfully and give in obedience. If God commanded Noah to build an ark and he built a canoe, he would have died in the flood. When God says give a certain amount, don't give a portion of that amount. There's like people, well, I, I don't believe you should tithe 10%. I believe you can tithe 5%. First of all, genius, the word tithe is 10%. So I don't know how you can give 10% of, <laughs> of 5% of just, it doesn't make any sense. These people need like a basic grade three math course. When you tithe, it's 10%. When God says to tithe, it's because he's got an abundance reserved for you. How do I know how much to sow? All pink ass. If anyone ever gives you an amount to sow, run. Ask the Holy Spirit what he'd have you give. And usually it's something that represents a sacrifice. Because if you don't feel it leave your hand, then you're not going to feel the blessing come back into your hand. He that sows sparingly will reap sparingly. But if you sow bountifully, you'll reap bountifully. Ask the Lord, and the Lord will give you the exact, uh, the exact uh, amount to give. I can't tell you how much to give, 
but be sensitive to the leading of the Holy Spirit. We don't accept Venmo, Kendra. Hey, Sandra. Sandra is one of the, Sandra Roberts on YouTube is one of the people that flew in from Vancouver, British Columbia to be in those meetings uh, and brought her whole youth group or at least a portion of her youth group to be there. And they were rocked. God touched them in a mighty way. They'll never be the same. It was great meeting you guys. And hopefully I'll be, I'll be in Vancouver sooner than later. Lord willing. All right. How do I know how much? Reunion Island. I don't know where Reunion Island is, but I pray one day we'll, we'll reunite on Reunion Island. Audre Kwan. How do I sow? Darius Dina. Salvationnow.ca slash give. Let me write it again, just in case. And you can give via PayPal, uh, debit credit. You can do e-transfer if you're in Canada, or you can give uh, by snail mail and send us. We have our address. Everything's listed. All the instructions are there. I'm in Ontario, Canada. Praise the Lord. All right. I love you all. I'll see you Tuesday. By the way, this weekend, if you're in Montreal or in the surrounding areas or Ottawa, whatever, I'm at Good News Chapel. Sunday morning, 10.30 a.m. One service only. Good News Chapel. Montreal, Quebec, Sunday morning, 10.30 a.m. One service only, Good News Chapel, 10.30 a.m., Sunday morning, one service only. And uh, I'll be preaching there. So if you're in the area, I'd love to see you come out and, uh, and you'll be blessed. Till next time, enjoy your weekend. God bless you.